Welcome to the Way Ministries Bible Study with Pastor John. Tonight's study will be in the book of Job. We invite you to join us at 1 Oakley Avenue in North Providence, Rhode Island. This podcast is presented to you by the Way Ministries, supported by listeners like you. For donations, live videos, podcasts, and more, please visit www.thewayministriesri.org. Thank you and have a great day. All right, we're going to get started. All right, welcome to the Coming Out of the Dark Bible Study. I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight to get a portion of God's Word. Amen. Uh, Let's thank our Lord and Savior tonight. Thank you, Jesus, for always being with us, Lord. Never leaving us, nor forsaking us, Lord. Even when we leave you, Lord, you're always with us. We're grateful and thankful. I'd like to thank the core of the ministry, one body, many parts, as we all get together to let this function properly. If you have a cell phone, please silence it so it doesn't disturb tonight's study. And as always, we will start with a word of prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, Abba Father, thank you, Lord. We're so thankful tonight, Lord, as Thanksgiving Eve, Lord, to be grateful and thankful that we could gather together tonight, Lord, to prepare for tomorrow, that beautiful day of thanksgiving, Lord, always giving thanks to you, Lord, and everything. Let us not only give thanks on thanksgiving, but every day, Lord, as we follow you, Lord, as we follow you to your kingdom, Father. Help us to crucify our flesh every day, Lord, as the enemy's always trying to get in, Lord, into the church, into our minds, into the world, Lord. Help us, Lord. Help our nation. I pray for our great nation. United States, Lord, that we go back to the principles of the Bible and slap that Bible back on the White House table, Lord, and we use them principles to govern our our country, Lord, to bring it back into submission to you, Lord, so we can, in God we trust you again, Lord, and bring this nation back to wholeness, Father. I pray for the nation Israel and all the other countries that are at war, that you... Take the tyranny out of these people's hearts, Lord, and fill it with your love, Lord, so we could all get along in this world, Lord, as we prepare for your coming back, Lord Jesus. Help us to be ready for when you do come back, Lord, so we don't fail to see you, Lord. We want to see you in everything. Father, we pray for the people that are sick and suffering out there, Lord. You reassure them that everything you do in everyone's life, Lord, is to make us more like your son, the Lord Jesus, Lord. Mold us and shape us the way you have us, Lord, so we can glorify you and build your kingdom, Father. And as always, let all this be led by your spirit tonight, Lord, and not our flesh. And it's in Jesus' powerful name I pray. Amen Amen and amen. All right, we're going to stand and worship the Lord and get started.
He's always by our side, even when we don't feel him. This big feelings thing, everybody's in this emotional roller coaster in this country, that's for sure. God's telling us to grow up and be mature in our faith, to understand it. He's with us, he's never going to leave us or forsake us, and when he tests us, the teacher is always silent during the test. You're not going to sense him or feel him. Is he, is he, God wants to see where your faith is in him. If you want, fall apart, start complaining and griping, then he knows that you're still a little baby. And you're still whining like a kid and you need to grow up. And there's a lot of room to grow. We need it, don't we? Yes, we do. But, uh, our performance doesn't uh, make God happy. Our faith does. And how much of it we can apply. All right. Hearing the word and doing the word is two different things. People hear the word all the time. They never do nothing with it. You know, you can end up with what? A dead faith. All right. We got Colossians chapter 1 up on the board there. Let's go there. We're going to conclude our study of the book of Job tonight. Maybe we'll get into another book. Maybe I'll just give some more message on Thanksgiving. I think we need to be a little bit more thankful in this world today. Really. We're definitely a spoiled nation, and sometimes the church gets spoiled too, to be honest with you. We have to understand that. Listen, this can be taken off us at any given time without even warning. We have to be ready for that. All right, Colossians chapter 1. She got us in verse 9. Let's go to verse 6. All right, the Holy Spirit will be taken over as they go into these scriptures. Try to clear your mind of the worries of the world today and everything that was going on to prepare your hearts to receive the message the Spirit is trying to say to the church tonight. Amen? Okay. Colossians chapter 1, verse 6. This same good news that came to you is going out all over the world. Right now, this message is going out all over the world. Amen? Amen. All over the world. And look what it says it does. It is bearing fruit everywhere. Now, it says the fruit that it's bearing everywhere by what? Changing lives. Not just the word going up, but changing people's lives. Right? Just as it changed your lives from the day you first heard and understood the truth about God's wonderful grace. God's wonderful grace gives us the ability to change. How about a big amen there? You learned about the good news from Epaphras. Our beloved co-worker. He is Christ's faithful servant. And he is helping us on your behalf. He has told us about the love for others that the Holy Spirit has given you. See, when we're in the Spirit, we have unconditional love for others. We stop talking about others. We stop griping about other people. We stop what? Loving other people, building them up, knowing that, look, I can be unlovable at any time too. So I have to be lovable always to everybody. Because God's lovable to me. It's unconditional. And it's the Holy Spirit. It's not the flesh. Verse 9. So we have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will. And to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Now, when God gives us, listen what it says, complete knowledge of his will and spiritual wisdom and understanding, look what it says that produces in verse 10. Then the way that you live, not the way that you show up for church, it says the way you live will always honor and please the Lord, and your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. See, there's a guarantee. If you're, if you're, if you're doing this in the right state of mind, get the knowledge, and right, spiritual wisdom and understanding, the way you live will show that you're getting it right. Can I get an amen here? Not just showing up in church. The way you live will show you if you're getting this. Look what it says. Then the way you live, verse 10, will always honor and please the Lord, and your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while, you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. Now, to have God is one thing, but we have to learn to know him. Can I get an amen here? So, if Christians understood that we need to learn to know him, why isn't the church full right now? 
Did they not miss? Did they miss that scripture? Especially tonight, right? It's the night before Thanksgiving. We all need to know that when we get with our biological families, that there could be a lot of bickering and arguing and complaining going on, that we know that we can zip it and represent the Lord properly, and this will give us the, the strength we need to handle that tomorrow. Amen? Because you know it as well as I do when family gets together. Mm. We don't want to be part of the problem. We want to be part of the what? Solution. And maybe we'd be the ones that are going to pray at the table, you know, for everybody to get along and to love one another, you know, instead of just saying, oh, thankful for the food. How about thankful for the people, thankful for our life, thankful for the, the, the warm home that we're in. Thank you for our brothers and sisters. Put us in the right state of mind to love people unconditionally and show a testimony that what I'm going to church to do is actually doing something in my life and changing me. How about a big amen there? Okay, look at verse 11. We also pray that you will be strengthened with all his glorious power so that you will have all the endurance and patience you need. Now, we need to walk this Christian walk. We need a lot of endurance and a lot of patience. Don't we agree? But he prays that we'll be his, strength, his glorious power will come into us and produce that. We can't do it in the flesh. May you be filled with joy, always thanking the Father. He has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to his people who live in the dark. Oh, no. He says who live in the light. Not Listen, he's not telling about people that have the light. He's talking about people who live in the light. There's two different things here. A lot of people have the light but don't live in the light. It says, always thanking the Father. He has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to his people who live in the light, not to his people who live in the dark. For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. I'll bring an amen for that. We're forgiven of all our sins. Why does the devil still make us think that we're not? Why? Because we keep committing them. That's why. So we figure that we're not forgiven. Why do we keep committing them? Because we have this sinful body that we're born with. And it continues to sin even though Jesus forgave us already. It's nasty. We have a nasty flesh. Everybody knows, oh, I'm not that bad. No, we're bad. We, can you honestly say that none of us sin every day all the time? Why? Because it's in us. We're naturally been taught. Thought, word, and deed. Now, if you didn't say it outward to somebody, you might have thought something ill will against somebody or something. Oh, what, complained or griped? And nobody heard it, but oh, I look like a good Christian. But inside, you're full of dead men's bones and griping. How about a big amen there? All right, let us go to our study. That was a great scripture. Colossians is a good book. We'll be studying it, but not yet. I wonder what book we will be studying tonight, Lord. Which one's it going to be? <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you know. It might happen tonight and it might not. Let's see what we got here. Let's keep going. Let the Spirit speak tonight. Let's go to Job 42. Job responds to the Lord. This is the last chapter, and it's a very, very important chapter that we have to grasp it. So we're going to. Then Job replied to the Lord. I know that you can do anything and no one can stop you. So Job said, I know for a fact that he can do anything and nobody can stop him. Okay? You asked, who is it that questions my wisdom with such ignorance? Look at Job, how humble he just got. It is I. And I was talking about things I knew nothing about. How many times do we talk about things we know nothing about? Think that we know God's ways, right? Okay, sure we do. Things too wonderful, too, <laughs> things far too wonderful for me. You said, listen, and I will speak. I have some questions for you. And you should? No, you must answer them. I had only heard about you before, but now... I have seen you with my own eyes. 
Wow, is that powerful or what? Now before we go on, Job was quoting the Lord's earlier questions to him in chapter 38, verses 2 and 3. That's what he was doing. He was reiterating. He openly and honestly faced God and admitted that he was the one who had been foolish. Are you using what you can't understand as an excuse for your lack of trust? Admit to God that you don't even have enough faith to trust him. True faith begins in such humility. How about a big amen there? Now, look at verse 6. I take back everything I said. And I sit in the dust and ashes to show my repentance. Do we ever say, that would be a good prayer to go back to the Lord, wouldn't it? Look, I take back, well, whatever I said or thought about you. I sit in the, sit in the dark and just let him show that you repented of that. And I, Lord, I'm not going to question you anymore. I'm just going to trust you. We all need to get there. Now listen, before we go on, look at, <laughs> throughout this book, we read about Job's friends, okay? Asking him to admit his sin and ask for forgiveness. Eventually, Job did indeed repent, right? Ironically, Job's repentance was not the kind called for by his friends, though. No. <laughs> He did not ask forgiveness for committing secret sins, but for questioning God's sovereignty and justice. How many times do we question God's sovereignty and justice and think that that's not a sin? It is a sin to question God. Job repented of his attitude and acknowledged God's great power and perfect justice. We sin when we angrily ask, if God is in control, how could he let this happen? How many times have you heard that from people? How could God let that happen? Right? Because we are locked into time, reasons for everything that happens. Thus, we must often choose between doubt and trust. Right? Will you trust God with your unanswered questions tonight? How many of us have unanswered questions? Do we trust God with them, or do we try to find them ourselves throughout, out of the Bible and into the uh, other books? Let me tell you something. When you deviate from the Bible for your answers, you are getting answers from the devil, not from God. There is no reason to get into any other book to answer any questions you have with God, rather than right from his mouth, which is in the Word of God. Can I get an amen here? Too many times people go into other books thinking that's God. There's only one book that's truly God's word, and it's the Bible. Can I get an amen? Everything else, commentaries, other people's opinions, they're good, but they're not coming right from God's mouth. You're listening to what other people think about God instead of you developing that relationship with him and him talking to you through his word. And again, you know what it is? We're rambunctious. We want answers. I mean, if I can't get an answer while I'm reading the Bible, I'm going to go out and find something that will give me an answer. I, I'm Listen, I'm sitting here, I'm standing here, I'm giving people a warning from here, from the pulpit to this. This is not me, it's the Spirit. When you deviate from the Word of God to get your answers, don't think it's God. It's not God. Whether I'm online, people can see what I'm hearing, what I'm saying. It's not God when you go into any other book for God's will. Can I get an amen here? It gets, you know what it does? It causes confusion. Mm -hmm. Saying, well, how come that wasn't in the Bible? Because the human mind always wanders and wonders. All right, let's read the conclusion. The Lord blesses Job. All right, so after all he went through, he got blessed. How many times... Do we go through problems and we miss the blessing because we what? Give up, complain, and gripe. And God says, well, you missed the blessing. I, look, I was trying to give you a blessing through the testing to see how much faith you had in me so I could bless you, but you failed the test so I can't. But if you listen and you understand what the book of Job is saying, whatever you're going through, whether you're, your intellect can't understand it or not, is to trust God. You're, he's your father. He knows exactly what he's doing in your life, and he's how he's going to change you. 
You can't change you. Only he can change you. And the way he does it is not the way we know it. He changes us in a completely different way. He puts people in front of us that we'd rather not have in front of us <laughs> to change us the way we think and our perception. What are we supposed to do? Zip it. Not answer back, not try to get an explanation, not try to defend God, but to keep your mouth shut when you should. So he can what? Do the work he needs to do in you. Just remember, whatever comes in front of you when you wake up tomorrow morning is to change you, not to, ma not to make you any other way but like Jesus. It's to change you. Listen, you can't change anybody, and God's working in your life personally to change you. So if you don't think you need to change, you're just one prideful, arrogant son of a gun, and God's going to chasten you even more. How many of us still got a lot of pride in us? Don't answer that. Go before God and say, Lord, please knock the pride out of me. Because you can't, he can't bless you with pride. And that's why you get miserable Christians. All right, look at verse 7. After the Lord had finished speaking to Job, he said to Eliphaz the Temanite, I am angry with you and your two friends, for you have not spoken accurately about me, as my servant Job has. So, how many times do you think God might be a little mad at us for speaking the wrong way about God? Or maybe passing judgment on someone, God's not happy, or God might not like you, but God probably doesn't do this, or God probably doesn't do that. And you expect him to bless you after you get like that with him. He just said right here, he was angry about it, the way they talk, spoke of him. So wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be wise for us to not speak about him at all unless... You know, we know what we're talking about, like, you know, to become like Jesus for us before we open our mouths, Nick, and we have it all together and know God? Yeah. Yes. Well, you know, like everybody said, if you ain't got anything good to say, what? Don't say nothing. How many times do we have not good things to say? Especially to the ones sitting next to each other. That's the sad part. God is what's judging. He's judging that more than anything else. The people you live with and with every day and how you treat them. You're supposed to treat them like Jesus. If that person that you're sitting next to was Jesus, how would you speak to them? Quiet, right? But that's what he says. He calls us to treat everybody like Jesus. So when you don't, don't think that you can make up for that by coming to church and doing works in the church. That doesn't fix it. That doesn't fix your heart problem. You end up becoming miserable and doing this all in the flesh. Can I get an amen here? He, and you know, what, you know what the beauty of it? He's just so patient with us. We're just so stubborn and full of performance that we miss the mark of changing and becoming like him. The whole idea of it, this whole thing, this whole church in Christendom is to make us like Jesus. And whatever he puts in front of us, he's using to do that. And when we reject it, we rebel against him. And then he chastens us and disciplines us. By what? Shut him, hide it from us. You can't get him anywhere. You can't hear, he's not hearing you. It's like, he's like this, huh? What'd you say? Oh, wait a minute. You can't get on your knees and just repent, can you? And be humble and saying, I blew it. And then apologize to the person you, didn't, you just disrespected. How about a big amen there? Right. Church has a lot of growing up to do if they want to be like Jesus. As a matter of fact, he hated the religious leaders that knew the, knew the scriptures inside and out. But they didn't live one iota of it. To quote it, but none of it was in their heart. It was only in their head. See, when it gets in your head, it has to go into your heart or it doesn't produce anything. The written word that goes up here has to become the living word that goes in here. And then you what? Live out what you're learning. How about a big amen there? Yeah. Okay. Or an ouch. Either one. Okay. Look at verse 7. All right. He said, I'm angry with you and your two friends for you have not spoken accurately. So take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer a burnt offering for yourselves. Wow. Seven. That was to complete it, okay? My servant Job will pray for you, and I will accept his prayer on your behalf. 
I will not treat you as you deserve, for you have not spoken accurately about me as my servant Job has. So Job said, even though he was saying all these things, he spoke accurately about God. All right, now listen, before we go on, God made it clear that Job's friends were wrong. The fact that God did not mention any specific sin shown that he was confirming Job's claim to have led a devout and obedient life. Exactly. Because they, everything they said was wrong about Job. Job's friends had made the error of assuming that Job's suffering was caused by some great sin. How many of us think somebody's suffering? God must be getting them. God mustn't be happy with them. When Job did not do anything, he was just getting tested. How many times do we get tested? We get tested all the time. But here's the thing. Do we evaluate ourselves when we're getting tested? Or do we start griping and complaining? Why, God, why? Instead of saying, I got to go look in the mirror. I'm using my, my religion to, 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 to think that I'm doing the right thing by going to church, reading the Bible, but it's not going into my heart and I'm not producing anything with it, so that's why God's doing what he's doing. When you go in the mirror and evaluate that, and if you are doing that, then you're just getting tested so, and pruned so you can produce more fruit. But you've got to take a look in the inside and say, make sure it's not me that's getting this because what I'm doing. How many people don't want to look in the mirror? And they go like this. If you didn't say that, I wouldn't have said this. Why are you always pecking at me? That's Jesus pecking at you. Believe me. When you get pecked at, that's God pecking at you to bring out what? Your sin nature that you still that you say that you don't have anymore. And then he what? Comes right up. It's the pressure cooker to show you you. How else do you see you unless there's an adversity? When do you really show up? Not when you're getting blessed. When you're getting blessed, oh, I love you, Jesus. Oh, and you love everybody. You go out of the house, hi, everybody, yeah. What's going on? People love it, love Jesus. But what happens when things ain't going right? And people are coming at you, right? The boss is mad at you. The, the traffic is everywhere. The kids ain't doing anything. Your wife doesn't want to hear it. She's misunderstanding you. Then... Oh, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, for giving me all them problems. That's what he's asking us to do. Thank you, Jesus, for showing me me. That, you want him to be a mature Christian? You need to see you more than you see someone else. You need to see you. When you can start to see you more than you see someone else, then you know you're making progress. It's me. It's me. Oof. These are some tough lessons, right? But I mean, if you want to grow and become the Christian that God wants you to become, this is the stuff that you have to hear, or else it'll never happen. I can say, peace and blessings, everybody. Thanksgiving. Look at the big trick you're getting tomorrow. <laughs> right? Yeah, sure. We're getting blessed. Sure we are. The devil blesses too, you know. He blesses materially to what? Keep you out of God's will. Everybody thinks, wow, look at all these things. That must be a blessing from God. It could be a curse. Because he, they told the nation Israel, let your blessings become a stumbling block so you can't find me. Her prosperity became a stumbling block to the nation Israel because they were doing so good they forgot about their creator. And that's why they fell into sin. And that's what happens to us when we get, that's why God can't do that so often, because we're falling to sin too easy. <laughs> okay. Look at verse 9. So Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Nemethite did as the Lord commanded them, and the Lord accepted Job's prayer. Who wasn't in there? Elihu. Elihu had it right. That's why he couldn't, he didn't have to. He didn't have to. Elihu had it right. So if you want to understand God's character, you listen to Job and Elihu. 
Because that's they got his character right. <laughs> now look what it said. Look at verse ten. When Job prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes. In fact, the Lord gave him twice as much as before. What was the condition? That, what did Job have to do, though? He said, when Job prayed for his friends. So you got to understand, Job was not happy with them guys after what they did to him. And God's saying he had to pray for them. So that was a command, and until he did that, he didn't get restored. So how many times do we have to pray for the people that what? Get us wrong. Like a lot of people get me wrong. A lot of people get my wife wrong. A lot of people get everybody wrong and get the right, wrong idea about people, right? Sometimes you can't change what people think. I don't know how many times I get misunderstood in work when I'm just trying to make a point or do something good. They misunderstand you and think you're doing something wrong. It's just crazy. But you can't do anything about that. You can't change their mind, so you just pray. All right, before we go on. After receiving much criticism, Job was still able to pray for his three friends. Think about that. That's integrity. It is difficult to forgive someone who has accused you of wrongdoing, but Job did. Are you praying for those who have hurt you? Can you forgive them? Follow the actions of Job, whom God called a good man, and pray for those who have wronged you. Imagine, God called Job a good man. Nobody else in the Bible was ever called a good man. It was a, David was a man after God's heart. But let me tell you some of the things that he did. He was not a good man. To take someone's wife and kill, a, kill his best friend is not a good man, doesn't do that. But he didn't call him a good man. He said he was a man after his heart. That's why we all, a lot of us are a man after God's heart, but we still have this what? It's evil. Even Lot, he called Lot a righteous man who hated what he was seen going on around him. But his flesh kept him there, why? For money. But what did it do? It destroyed his family. Right? Because of that environment, what did his daughters do with him? Because that's all they knew. That's what they've seen happen all the time. Because when you, you're a product of your environment. So wouldn't it be wise if you want to raise your kids right to raise them in a what? Good, loving environment where you're not back and forth with each other in front of them? Because that, that's, that's a hostile environment that what? Can destroy them. They take it all in. Thank God he loves us, right? We get it so wrong. We get it so wrong. And think that we got it right. And then when you think about the things that he's saying to do. Now look at verse 11. Then all his brothers, sisters, and former friends came and feasted with him in his home. Imagine they all came back. What happened? After we got everything back. Hey, Joe, what happened, buddy? Remember me? I couldn't find them before. Where'd they go? When problems come, right? Let me tell you something. You know your friends, your real friends, are there for you whether you did something right or you did something wrong. They're not gonna, they're not gonna um, condone what you did, but they're not gonna walk away from you either or desert you. They're gonna tell you that you're wrong, but I love you. I'm gonna hang in there with you and pray for you. That's a friend. Other than that, it's conditional, right? I gotta say, my wife's my best friend because I don't make her happy all the time. And believe me, she don't make me happy all the time either. <laughs> but guess what? Jesus is in the middle of our marriage. Amen. And that's what counts. Amen. So when I put him in the middle of our marriage, we are okay. Me and my wife are okay no matter what's going on. We're gonna be okay. Jesus said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And I said, you know what those vows I made before God? I'm going to keep them. There's no such thing as irreconcilable differences. We're all different. 
When was that ever in the clause of the vows you make? Can I get an amen here? Everything's reconcilable with Christ. I can do all things with Christ. I can forgive and I can reconcile with the people that hurt me. How about a big amen there? Okay. Now look what it said. And they look at it, feasted with him and they consoled him and comforted him because of all the trials the Lord had brought against him. And each of them brought him a gift of money and a gold ring. Imagine they brought him a gift. <laughs> well, each of them brought him a gift, or a, they call it a kesetah in, in Hebrew. The value or weight of the kesetah is no longer known in a gold ring. So that's what it must have been, you know. That's what they're saying. You know what I mean? So, But the, they said uh, all the trials the Lord had brought against him. See, they knew it was from the Lord. Everything comes from the Lord. Everything in your life has to go through God's, through his will, through his hand. Everything. And there's not one thing that happens in your life that God did, is in control of. He has to allow the devil to come in. He has to allow the adversity. He has to allow the blessing. And he has to allow the chastening. In whatever way he has to use, he'll use the devil to chasten you. He'll use what? Your job to chasten you. He'll use your wife to chasten you. He'll use your friends to chasten you. He'll, whatever it takes, he's going to use, and he works through people because God is a, a spirit. In order for a spirit to manifest itself, like God's working through me right now. His spirit is working through me, conveying the message to you. Can I get an amen here? So that's what a spiritual growth is. The spirit of God is working through people to get to you. That's how he does it. So what you should be saying every day is, thank you, Jesus, for whatever you put in front of me. I know it's to make me better. Please don't let me get bitter. Because when you get bitter, you get angry, and anger gives a foothold to who? The devil. the devil. And you can't represent the Lord properly. Can I get an amen here? That's why being thankful is the most important thing, and thanksgiving is the best opportunity to show that. I'm thankful for my people, the sandpaper. The sandpaper in my life that helps me to change. There is no growth without resistance. So we're gonna, in other words, you should think yourself as honored that God's considering you, he wants to change you so you can grow, so he's going to put some adversity in front of you. It's, it's a blessing, not if you understand it right. See, but Christians aren't taught right. They walk away from God when they go through adversity because they're not taught that it's part of it. They think that everybody's just supposed to come to church and get blessed all the time. My life is supposed to get better. No, your life is going to change. And it's not necessarily what you think is better. It's what God thinks is better. And that's why we get bitter. Because we're not accepting what God's doing in our lives. And we get the lemon face, right? I'm going to church, but I really don't want to. <laughs> Tell everybody I'm not coming to church. God's love, okay, is a little bit different than, I don't want to hurt their feelings. Listen, tell me, let me tell you something. You got kids, you need to tell them the truth. You're going to have to hurt their feelings. That's just the way it goes. Because God loved his people. What did he do? He put them in exile for 70 years. And he corrected them with the rod, by the way, not by the eye. I know my father used to get the belt when I was disobeying my mother. And that straightened me out. Well, I get the, after, after the belt, then I got the eye. Because I knew with the eye that if I didn't ch stop, I was going to get the belt. <laughs> so, the, well, God says, I want to change you by the eye of my word. Not the chastening hand of discipline that I have to put to people, places, and things. And again, amen here. You read the word of God, say, ooh, I'm not lining up with that. I better stop and change and repent. So I don't have to get the chastening hand of God. The eye comes, you repent, and it's done. Instead of getting the what? The, we become stubborn, and we have to get what? Chastened with the rod. Because we're not turning from that sin. 
Why? Because he loves us. He doesn't want to keep us in that. <laughs> okay. Now, in verse 12, so the Lord blessed Job in the second half of his life even more than in the beginning. For now he had 14,000 sheep. Think about that. 14,000 sheep. Six... <laughs> 6,000 camels, 1,000 teams of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. He also gave Job seven more sons and three more daughters. Wow, he got busy, huh? Wow. He named his first daughter Gemima, the second Kezia, and the third Karen Hapuk. Okay. In all the land, no women were as lovely as the daughters of Job. Wow. And their father put them into his will along with their brothers. <laughs> you ready to finish this up? Like, why not? Yeah, okay. Right. Job lived. 140 years after that, living to see, listen what he lived to see, four generations of his children and grandchildren. So he's a great, 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 great grandfather. Tell me that's not a blessing. See your kids, 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 kids. Usually we just see one, one round, maybe two. Like when it says, then he died, an old man who had lived a long, full life. Amen. Wow. <laughs> but I'm not done reiterating, so I'm not over yet. <laughs> but just imagine, he called it a long, full life. So a full life, okay, has blessings, right? Chastening, discipline, adversities, and hardship. That's a full life. What is it? Just because we come to Jesus doesn't mean that our life is just going to go rosy. He's just going to give us the ability to handle it properly so we can get through these trials with the less pain as possible. He gives us the opportunity to get through the trials in, like, in a steadfast mode. No matter what's going on, I'm okay. Whatever's going on, I'm okay. Why? Because God's in control. Once you can understand that God is in control in every situation in your life, you have no reason to get upset or angry anymore because he's in control of it and he's going to change it. The reason why you get angry, because you want to change it and control it, and you can't. And that's why you get bitter and angry and resentful. But when you understand God's in control... You get peace. My wife will tell you when I'm sitting there and I'm just peaceful. She says, I want that. I said, well, what you got to do is live, like, leave it in God's hands and you can have it. That's that simple. Say, so, yeah. Doom. Drop it in his hand and really leave it there. But no, we take it back, right? Okay. Now, let me just say something before we close this up. The main questions in the book of Job is timeless. It's timeless. Why do believers experience troubles and suffering? Through a long debate, Job's supposedly wise friends were unable to answer that question. Job's friends made a serious error for which God rebuked them. They assumed that trouble comes only because people sin. Does anybody think that here? I hope not. Trouble doesn't come because... Sometimes... See, that's where the evaluation comes in. People make the same mistake today when they assert that sickness or lack of material blessing is a sign of unconfessed sin or a lack of faith. A lot of people say that all the time, you just didn't have enough faith. That's why that happened to you. That's not the case. Through following God, listen, though following God normally but not always leads to a happier life, and rebelling against God normally but not always leads to an unhappy life. God is in control of our circumstances. In our world, invaded by sin, 
Calamity and suffering may come to good and bad alike. This does not mean that God is indifferent, uncaring, unjust, or powerless to protect us. Bad things happen because we live in a fallen world. The world is in a fallen condition because of the fall. Where both believers and unbelievers are hit with the tragic consequences of sin. See, if sin never came into the world, we'd all be in the garden today. You see? But since sin came into the world, death came into the world. Back then, they, nobody was going to die. It was eternal. eternal. What do you think eternal life is? Forever. We live forever. S without sin, we live forever. What do you think our born-again spirit is? It's a sinless spirit. That's why when we, we, we leave this earthly body, we live forever. Because now we're going to be sinless. We have to shed this body to become sinless, though. This body can't inherit eternal life because it's infected with sin. There's no cure for that. The only cure is to get a new resurrected body. I can't wait for that one, huh? Just imagine when you get up in the morning, or maybe you might not even have to sleep anymore. I don't even know how that works. <laughs> or eat. Yeah, well, that was only because of the fall that they had to eat. In the Garden of Eden, they didn't have anything. They were spiritual. Spiritual people don't need food. They don't need water. They don't need anything. You see? To survive. Until the fall, then that's what they had to do. It goes way beyond that. I can't get into it right now, but it goes way beyond that, okay? But, we, but listen, <laughs> turns, listen, but, but God allows evil for a time, although he eventually turns it around for our good. Romans 8, 28. God works everything together for the good for those who love God and are called according to his people. Now, you have to believe that. If you believe it, you receive it. We may have no answers as to why God allows evil, okay? But we can be sure he is all-powerful and knows what he's doing. The next time you face trials and dilemmas, see them as opportunities to turn to God for strength. You will find in God one who only desires to show his love and compassion to you. If you can trust him in pain, confusion, and loneliness, you will win the victory and eliminate doubt. One of Satan's greatest footholds in your life. What kept the nation Israel out of the promised land? Unbelief, which is doubt. How many times do we doubt what God's doing? If I go back and look from the beginning of this whole picture of what, how we started all this and where we are today, he came through. I never... To have this compared to what we had when we started, I couldn't see that. My wife was, I couldn't see that happen and us having this from, as a result from being faithful to God. But here it is. I didn't know what was going to come of it. But wow, amazing. He just worked it all out. If I go back and look at the whole picture, how he's working, and there's still more to come. I don't understand why believers don't want to get involved with this mission. It's unbelievable. When you see it play out for the whole thing, you get involved with the church because that's, your, that's, that's what his will is for you, to get involved with the church to help build his kingdom. People get disconnected and go off on their own, and they're disconnected from the vine. They're really not serving God. They're serving themselves. You serve God when you're connected to a body of believers that are in the same goal to bring others into the kingdom. You jump full force in, all in, and everything else falls into place in your life. It's just amazing how it happens. He gives us the strength and energy we never thought we had to do all this stuff. I'm a living example of that happening. And it's amazing. All you have to do is what? Trust him and turn your will over to him. Make God your foundation. You can never be separated from his love. You imagine, I just got done with that. And it's 8 o'clock on the bus. Yep. Yeah. It's 8 o'clock right now. They're not going to know until next time we meet. Ah. I might, might, maybe I'll let you know. I don't know. But not tonight. <laughs> All right.
I just want to wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving, really, I do. I love all of you, and I hope you have a happy Thanksgiving. I hope you use some of these principles tomorrow and then sandpaper people in your family come at you. But I try. Maybe you could diffuse something that might be going on at the table. Amen? You could be the mouthpiece for Jesus tomorrow. Amen? All right, Dave, you want to come up and close us? Lord, we're so grateful and thankful to have this beautiful church, Lord, where we get to gather together and, and hear your word. And Lord, as we gather together over this holiday season, Lord, and give thanks to and for our family and friends, Lord, I just pray that we would never forget and always remember to give thanks and praise to you, Lord. Yes. And always be mindful of that sacrifice that Jesus made for us on that cross, Lord. And Lord, we're just so grateful and thankful for the messages that you give to Pastor, Lord. And for a pastor who preaches the message as, as they are intended to be preached, Lord, regardless if somebody might get offended or convicted, Lord, Lord, I just pray that for the strength to use those, those convictions, Lord, to make the changes needed in order for us to live the life you called us to live, Lord. And Lord, I just pray you continue to watch over this church and our families, Lord. And I just pray for those who might be sick, not feeling well, or just going through that tough time, Lord, that you would just touch their hearts, reassure them you'll never leave them nor forsake them, and that you're with them always. And I just pray this in your holy, precious name. Amen. 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 All right. Thank you. All right. We're going to watch a video, and we are going to close.